All right, thanks, Titus. All right, uh, good evening. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, verse 1? Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, this evening we're going to uh, study Daniel chapter 3, verse 3, and uh, we're going to see that the uh, last evening actually we saw that uh, Nebuchadnezzar gave an order for all his dignitaries from around the various provinces in his kingdom to attend the t- dedication of a statue that he constructed that was made of solid gold. And of course this uh, dedication was religious and political in nature, and he was combining the two because he wanted to unite his kingdom. And also, because of his great pride and arrogance and his rebellion against God, he had this dedication. And so, uh, the, uh, in Daniel uh, 3, 2, we saw he gave the order for these dignitaries from around the various uh, provinces of his kingdom to attend this dedication. Now, in verse 3, we're going to see these, uh, these dignitaries obeying his orders. So, as we've been pointing out, uh, his, uh, with the repetition that is found... Uh, in, ver- in the first seven verses of chapter 3, we keep hearing this phrase, the, the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. That's repeated several times in the, in the first seven verses to emphasize the enormity of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's sin. Not only is he committing adult- idolatry himself, but he's also ordering other people to commit that sin as well. So we're going to have, uh, once we get through what this verse is saying, uh, then we're going to be talking a lot about idolatry uh, the sin of idolatry uh, th- this uh, this evening, and it's a a very important subject because it's something that uh, the church is involved in today. A lot of Christians are involved in this, and we're going to talk about what that is. And uh, of course, the unsaved are involved in this. This is one of the great sins of humanity, and something that Paul talks about. One of the the, the manifestations of of the sin nature, as Paul talked about in Romans chapter one. And uh, one of the things that puts men under the wrath of God, sinful humanity, is that they commit the sin of idolatry. So that'll be our subject this evening, Daniel chapter 3, verse 3. So without further ado, let's take that moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to hear the teaching of the Word of God. That means confessing any known sin to the Father. Uh, That uh, restores us to fellowship with God. The basis for that restoration is the work of Christ on the cross. And once we've been restored, we maintain that fellowship by bringing our thinking, our thoughts, into obedience to the Spirit. In other words, bringing our thoughts into obedience to the Word of God because the Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures as according to 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. If there's anything that's disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with that said, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us another day to learn about your character and nature, to learn about who and what you are, who and what your Son is in the Spirit, and what you've done for us through both of them, we just, and what you're doing for us now and will do for us in the future. We thank you, Father, for the fact that your Son and the Spirit both pray for us at this particular time. With your Father, uh, with you, uh, your Son praying at your right hand on our behalf, and also the Holy Spirit indwelling us and praying for us at this particular time as well. Father, we thank you for gracing us out and giving us another day of Bible doctrine, another day of teaching the Word of God. And we pray that you would impress upon the church the importance of learning and applying the Word of God and that we can do nothing without the teaching of the Word of God, without obedience. We cannot bring glory to you if we're disobedient. So help us to uh, put as number one priority uh, your learning your word and then putting it into practice. We thank you, Father, for those who are assembled here this evening, not only in the Thompson household, but those who are, might be assembled on Pal Talk or through the website, listening or uh, viewing this class through the website. We thank you for them. We thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home so that we could teach the word of God on a consistent basis. And we just thank you for Titus and Tyler's work. Uh, behind the uh, computers, and we just pray that you would give them wisdom with the technology. We pray that we wouldn't have any problems with the technology this evening. We thank you, Father, 
for it. And we also, uh, we pray that you would help us, all those in the audience, to learn, to understand and apply, make the proper and accurate application of what's being taught here this evening in regards to Daniel chapter 3, verse 3. We pray that you would give grace to myself so that I could deliver to your people everything you want them to hear, to deliver your full counsel, and to do so in a manner that is with uh, reverence and respect for your word and with power, and that the Holy Spirit would work, work mightily and powerfully, not only through the communicator, but also through those in the audience, so that we might be transformed by the message and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for these people and things in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 is where you should all be. As I noted a few moments ago, we're going to note Daniel 3, 3. And in this verse, uh, Daniel tells us, he records the dignitaries in the various provinces in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom obeying his orders and standing directly in front of a 90-foot-tall gold statue he erected of himself, as we pointed out, in order to await the call to worship this statue. So we see they're awaiting uh, Nebuchadnezzar to, give the, uh, to make the order. When the music plays, they all bow down. So they have, uh, they, the, before that has taken place, uh, before the herald speaks in verse 4 and verse 5 and verse 6, we see that he issued an order uh, to go throughout the kingdom, all of the various kingdoms he had conquered or different provinces, to asc- and he, he ordered that all the dignitaries would assemble at, this de- at the dedication of this gold statue he erected of himself. Remember, the, uh, it is of himself because there's a connection between the gold head of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the solid gold statue that he erected of himself in Daniel chapter 3. We see that there's the events in chapter 3, as we pointed out, are right on the heels of the events of chapter 2. Remember, Daniel told the king his in- the interpretation of his dream as well as the content. He's the head of gold and the statue in his dream. And God had given him great power and basically to be a worldwide ruler at that particular time. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is not responded in the way God wanted him to in humility and thanksgiving and worshiping him. He has turned turned that that, uh, information that he received into arrogance. And so he is filled with pride. He was filled with pride to start with. But now he's even greater involved in greater arrogance. And God is going to bring him to his knees as we'll see in chapter 4. But before that takes place, we see him committing a very tremendous sin against God, the sin of idolatry. He's not only commanding and ordering people in his kingdom to commit this sin, but uh, but he's also committing it um, of himself. And he's he's not just worshiping the god Marduk, he is worshiping actually himself. So uh, we see that in our day and age today that happens. The Roman emperors did this. They deified themselves. The Hellenistic kings did this. The Assyrian kings did this. So what he's doing is nothing new in history. Now remember, uh, the reasons why he had, uh, he had erected this statue. One, because of his great pride. He had tremendous pride in, his, in what he had done. We see this is reflected in chapter 4. Uh, he also did this to unify the kingdom, uh, uh, unify his kingdom. He had a a lot of countries he had conquered. There were different provinces in his kingdom. And so he wanted all these people, all these kingdoms and provinces to unite behind him. And so also the third reason why he does this is that of his great rebellion. rebellion. He is expressing his rebellion against God by committing this sin and ordering others to commit this sin As well, so Nebuchadnezzar, in order to reflect this enormity of his sin, uh, in the first seven verses here of chapter three, which I pointed out to you last evening, there was a lot of repetition, uh, repetition as far as the instruments that were used to play the music and to to signal people to bow down to the image and worship it. Uh, The repetition uh, we'll see of the of the different dignitaries that assembled. To, for this dedication and the repetition of the fact that uh, the statement that Nebuchadnezzar had erected this statue. So all these things, all this repetition is for rhetorical effect to drive home to the reader uh, in, in words the enormity of his great sin. So once, and what we see sometimes in Hebrew is that they'll, the, the writer, or in Aramaic as we see here, the writer in the Old Testament will use this repetition for rhetorical effect. So this is what we got going on here at this particular point. Now in verse 3, 
We're going to be taught, once we get through uh, the information in the verse, what the verse is saying, once we've determined that, then we'll, we'll be going into a little bit of a study of idolatry or talking about it. We've talked about it many times in the past, and there are some things that we're going to talk about that we haven't in a while. Now, look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Hey, Jody. It says in Daniel 3, 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits. Remember, that's equivalent to 90 feet. And it's with six cubits, that's equivalent to nine feet. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent word. Remember, he issued an order. What was that? To assemble the satraps, the prefects, those are the military commanders, and the governors, the counselors, those who were advisors to the first three groups, the treasurers, they took care of the finances in the kingdom. The, the judges, actually that's we're talking about lawyers there. The magistrates is, is talking about judges. And then he says, and all the rulers of the provinces. Remember the last evening, that's a exegetical clause. That phrase, all the rulers of the provinces, is referring to those seven groups that we just mentioned. Then he says... The, gives the purpose for this assembling assemblage of dignitaries. He says they're to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now the very first word in verse 3, the word then, it's actually two words in the Aramaic. Uh, it's an expression that it appears in, in Daniel in more than one occasion, as we'll see. And it's the it's a pr expression that's composed of the preposition bet, and then it's it's not translated, and it's used with the temporal adverb edayin, which we've seen in the past. So together the two words are correctly translated by the New American Standard as then. You could translate it next. Either one is good. Now, the temporal adverb at a yin is a temporal coordinator, and it means then because it's showing consecutive events in the narrative. So what it's doing here, it's introducing to the reader, us, that the next event that took place after Nebuchadnezzar issued this order to have all his dignitaries assemble for the dedication of the statue that he erected on the plain of Dura in the province of the city of Babylon. The preposition bet means when, because it functions also as a temporal marker, indicating a point of time or a point when something took place. So here it indicates that when the satraps, the military commanders, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the lawyers and the judges, in other words, each and every one of the dignitaries from these provinces in Babylon assembled for the dedication of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar erected, they all stood in front of the statue. So the first stage in the, in the, uh, in the worship of this gold image that Nebuchadnezzar erected of himself has been fulfilled, has come to pass. He, uh, he uh, uh, issued an order. The order went out throughout the kingdom, throughout the various provinces. Everybody who was a dignitary under his authority representing the people of those provinces had to come to this dedication of the statue. Now, uh, we have a repetition of the groups that we noted last evening. Again, the repetition is for a reason. It's for rhetorical effect. It's to drive home to the reader what the, enorm uh, the enormity, the tremendous sin that Nebuchadnezzar has committed. And so, therefore, I'm just going to briefly go through these uh, different uh, uh, officials, these different, di different dignitaries. The satraps, remember last evening, uh, that refers to a group of officials who were the chief representatives of Nebuchadnezzar, and they were governors of certain types of provinces. They were the highest officials in his kingdom. We know that because of last evening we saw in Daniel 3.1 that, that that verse records Darius, the Persian king, that, that came after Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, he appointed 120 satraps over his kingdom who would be in charge of his entire kingdom. So this word is used of somebody who's the highest official. That's why they're listed here as first. Now later on in Daniel chapter 6 we see with the Medes and the Persians, when he, he, worshipped, he, uh, he served under those kings, he was one of those satraps. So he was a very high official later on at, in life after the Babylonians were conquered. Now the word for prefects, it's, a, it's referring to military commanders 
and the various provinces. And the word for governors, peka, it means governor. It's correctly translated. Those are civil administrators or governors of civil government and the various provinces. The counselors, uh, they're in individuals. The word there in the Aramaic, remember, was an individual. It means uh, someone who's a minister of information. The word is adaya gazer, and that word means a minister of information. And so it refers to those individuals who gave counsel to the first three groups. They offered counsel to those in governmental authority and also, also those who were in, uh, in authority in the military. The word for treasurers, gedaz bar, gedaz bar is a word that's correctly translated here. It refers to somebody who's basically uh, uh, taking care of the finances of the kingdom. Remember last evening, we pointed out the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was probably the wealthiest man in the world at this time. In fact, I can guarantee you he was because uh, of all the, the, the kingdoms he conquered. He conquered Israel. He plundered their temple. He plundered all the temples of Egypt and their great wealth. So he was a very, very wealthy man. These individuals, the treasurers, they, the, uh, got the Gadar Bar, they're individuals who uh, oversaw the finances. The word for judges, as we pointed out, actually refers to somebody who's a lawyer and uh, not a judge. It speaks of somebody who's a guardian of the law. They administrated the law in the, in the different provinces. The word for magistrates, tif, tifta, tiftahi, is a word that means magistrate or judge and someone who actually uh, renders judgments, decisions with regards to law. They interpret law. And then we saw last evening this phrase, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled in the original. That's composed of the conjunction wa. And then we have the noun kol. It's actually functioning as an adjective. It's correctly translated as whole. And it's modifying the word shilton, which we saw last evening means rulers. And then the word medina, which we've seen in the past, is the word for provinces. Now, remember last evening... I pointed out that the word and there, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled, that word and is used in an explicative sense or an explanatory, or some say exegetical sense, meaning that the statement, all the rulers of the provinces were assembled, is explaining who these individuals were from a different perspective. It's a summary title, the word rulers. So the conjunction wa here is used in an explicative sense or explanatory sense, Meaning that the word is an expression which it's introducing a statement which uh, clarifies the list of officials who assembled for the dedication of the gold statue. So the expression, all the rulers of the provinces, is a summary title for the list of seven classes of officials mentioned by Daniel. So the word shilton, rulers, correctly translated, it's a summary title, summary, it's describing in summary fashion those seven lists uh, groups of officials that were just previously listed in, uh, in the verse. And the word coal, which is translated whole here, remember last evening we noted that it means totality, and it's used here in a distributive sense, meaning each and every. So what the word's saying is that each and every one of these dignitaries, who are called rulers of the various provinces, assembled in obedience to Nebuchadnezzar's command that he, ordered, he issued uh, to assemble. So, the word uh, Medina, province, it refers to the province of the city of Babylon. And the word Kenosh is the word for assemble, as we saw last evening. It denotes that the king issued an order for the purpose of assembling his officials from the various provinces of his kingdom for the dedication of this gold statue. Then, we have the phrase, for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And so this is a clause that's a purpose. This, this clause for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up is giving us the purpose for them assembling. It's giving us the purpose of the first order. Why did he issue the first order? To assemble for the dedication of the statue. Now, that phrase, that purpose clause for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up it begins with a prepositional phrase. We have the preposition le. And then we have as its object the word kanuka. We saw this last evening. It means dedication. And then we have the word for image, salam. We've seen this quite a bit. We saw it in chapter 2 uh, for the image, just statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
Here it's of the statue that he erected of himself. That was 90 feet tall and nine feet wide and solid gold. And it was in the billions of dollars. I think I was that last thing I said, trillions. It, billions of dollars, as we pointed out when we noted this verse, verse one. <clears throat> and then we have the word set up. That's a verb. The half al, perfect form of the verb kum. And then the word, the proper name for Nebuchadnezzar is Nebuchadnezzar. And then the word for king is Melech, as we pointed out. Now this word kanuka, dedication, it's the object of that preposition la, as we pointed out. And it means dedication of the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar erected. Now, the preposition functions as a marker of purpose. So that means that this statement for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, it's, it's a purpose clause. It's telling the reader the purpose for which Nebuchadnezzar had his dignitaries assemble. And then lastly, we have the statement, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. That's composed of the conjunction wa. And then we have the verb kum again, which is translated here, they stood. And then a prepositional phrase. We have the preposition le. And then we have the, the preposition ko bail, which is, now it's important because these two words are saying two different things here that describe what these guys were doing, uh, these uh, dignitaries before the statue. And then we have the word for image again, salem, followed by the, the particle d, which is translated here, that. And then once again, we have the word kum, the half l, a uh, perfect form of the verb kum, translated had set up. And then again, we have the proper name, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the word for Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the word kum that's used here twice in this verse, it means to stand, and it indicates that the satraps, the military commanders, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the lawyers, the judges from the various provinces in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom stood before this 90-foot-tall gold statue. Now, the preposition le. It's a marker of direction, and that indicates the direction in which these dignitaries stood. And it denotes that they stood facing toward this 90-foot-tall gold statue. It's interesting that this is exactly where we see Nebuchadnezzar in his dream. In his dream, he was in front of this tremendous statue that towered over him, and he was directly in front of it in the dream. That's the same idea that is brought over here with Nebuchadnezzar's dignitaries. That is telling us that there's a connection between what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream and where he was in front of the dream and what he, the dignitaries are doing here now before the, the statue that he erected. So there's a, there's, a, there's a connection between the two things. In the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2, we see that he's directly in front of it facing the statue and the dignitaries are doing the same thing. And it's done, it's, the same language is used in both chapters with regards to both statues with Nebuchadnezzar and these dignitaries. It's showing the connection here. Nebuchadnezzar is basically trying to reproduce this whole situation that he found himself in, which he didn't particularly like. Now, uh, this particular word, uh, this preposition le, it's joined to the preposition co bail, and it means in front of, and it indicates that these dignitaries stood in front of the great statue. So therefore, these two words literally indicate that all the dignitaries were facing toward this great statue. It was 90 feet tall. It was gold, nine feet wide. It was impressive. It was intimidating. Like the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream was intimidating to him, he was intimidating his dignitaries with this statue that he erected. And so therefore, we see here that the word kum, uh, it, when it says Nebuchadnezzar, that the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, had set up, that's the verb kum again. But this time, it's referring to what Nebuchadnezzar did. He constructed this gold statue. That's what it's talking about the second time this word kum is used. Now, now that we know what the, 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 the verse says, in fact, uh, let me read you my interpretive translation of these first three verses. And then what I want to do for the rest of the evening is I, I want to talk a lot about idolatry because this is the sin that Nebuchadnezzar's committing and this is what he's ordering others to do. So he's committing a great, great, enormous sin. A sin that is still being uh, committed uh, not only by unbelievers today, 
by a good, but by a good many Christians. So listen to my interpretive translation. I'll make it available when I, as soon as I can. But listen carefully to my interpretive translation of these three verses. Again, interpretive translation means it's reflecting my interpretation that I've given you on these verses. So <clears throat> he says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sculpted an image composed of gold, its height 90 feet, and its width 9 feet. He erected it on the plain of Dora in the province of the city of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, issued an order to assemble these satraps, the military commanders, as well as the governors, advisors, treasurers, lawyers, judges, in other words, each and every one of the dignitaries from the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar had erected. Then, when the satraps, the military commanders, as well as the governors, advisors, treasurers, lawyers, and judges, in other words, each and every one of the dignitaries from the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar the king had erected, they stood directly in front of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar had erected. So he's recreating it, what he saw in his dream in chapter 2. But this time, the, the whole statue is of himself. And remember, the head of gold was the only portion of the statue in his dream that spoke of his kingdom. Here, everything is gold. And he's intimidating, he's intimidating these dignitaries. Remember who he is. He's one of the most brilliant man, men in the ancient world. He had conquered all the Mesopotamian basin, which is now Iraq and Iran. He conquered Egypt. He conquered Israel. He conquered all those nations. He was a bad man, we'd call it today. Bad man meaning he was extremely tough and dangerous and courageous. He was a bad dude. And he was an individual who was very wealthy because of all the kingdoms he plundered and all the temples he had plundered. So here he is. He's used to intimidating people. And that's what he's doing here. He's intimidating all these dignitaries to commit this sin. Now in his eyes, remember he's an unbeliever, but in his eyes, this is not a sin. This is what they should be doing. So what he's doing here is intimidating his audience. He's intimidating these dignitaries. And what he, what he basically, if you don't do what I tell you to do, you're all dead. You're all dead. In fact, look at verse 4. Look at, the, look at the herald proclaims. This is what they're going to hear, as we'll see tomorrow. This is what they're going to hear from the king as to what they, that, need, that is required of them. And the death penalty is involved if they disobey it. So look at verse 4. Daniel 3, 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed to you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psalter, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you would have fall down and worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship the shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as a result, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psalter, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. He's intimidating him. And so therefore, this is pre, this we, as we've seen in the past, this is foreshadowing and prefiguring what Antichrist is going to do during the tribulation period. He's going to intimidate everybody into, worship being, into worshiping him. Uh, let me show you this. Look, look at Revelation chapter 13. Look at Revelation 13, 1, please. Revelation 13, 1. Revelation 13, 1. In Revelation chapter 13, it's giving us a picture in the first 10 verses of Antichrist. He's, there's two beasts in the chapter. One is Antichrist. The second one 
is the false prophet who's going to promote the worship of the Antichrist. Okay? Remember, there's a satanic trinity. Satan is, is, is aping God the Father, mimicking him. And Antichrist is going to be mimicking Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is mimicked by the false prophet, the satanic trinity. Now look at Revelation 13, 1. And the dragon, that's Satan, of course. We know that from chapter 12 tells us. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And the seashore, again, the oceans speak of the Gentile nations. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. The sea in the, there is speaking of the Gentile nations. Having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems. And on his heads, his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, just like Daniel chapter seven. He's going to have all these characteristics of those previous kingdoms in history mentioned in Daniel two and seven. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? And there was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months. It was given to him, 42 months, three and a half years. Jewish reckoning of time, 360 days in a year. That's, uh, that's, it's actually referring to Daniel 7.25, these 42 months. And then it says, He opened his mouth, uh, to, he's opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name, to slander his name, in his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. By who? God. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Hear what it says? All were now, what is Nebuchadnezzar trying to do? He's trying to get the world to worship him. He's the ruler of the known world. He's got the whole world uh, under his thumb. And God gave it to him. All, all these nations to conquer. Yet he's, instead of being humble before God and, and, and being uh, worshiping him because of this great honor that he'd given him, instead he uses it to, to, uh, to promote the worship of himself. So he's, he's foreshadowing, Nebuchadnezzar's for, actions here in chapter 3 are foreshadowing Antichrist's actions in chapter 13 and during the tribulation period. And then it says in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast of a different kind. This is the false prophet coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns. And look at it says, like a lamb. What's a lamb? Meek and mild. This is why I think it might be one of the popes in the future. Because the pope portrays himself as meek and mild like a lamb, right? Well, that's what the false prophet's going to be. And he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Who? Antichrist, the little horn, whose fatal wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And he, it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast. So that, this is the, the false prophet, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do, as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This is all idolatry. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men, and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. This technology is available already. The military already uses it. And it's used on animals and military, certain military individuals. And either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. But I brought you there because I told you that Nebuchadnezzar's actions in chapter 3, demanding worship, basically from the world, of himself, is prefiguring or foreshadowing 
what Antichrist is going to demand during the tribulation period. So Nebuchadnezzar, and, and you can go back to Daniel chapter 3, verse 3. In that verse, we have the record of Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, ordering his, his dignitaries to come to the dedication of this statue of himself. So verse 3 records the satraps, the military commanders in his kingdom, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, and the lawyers and the judges from the various provinces in his kingdom. They, it shows them obeying his order by assembling for the dedication of this 90-foot tall gold statue. Now, obviously, messengers were dispatched by the king to the various provinces in order to contact these various dignitaries who were subordinate to Nebuchadnezzar. So the dedication of the statue was a ceremony, as we just read in verses 3 through 7. What was it? Both religious and political. It was a solemn ceremony in which Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue was consecrated as the symbol of worldwide worship and power of himself as a divine being. So he's trying to get, like again, like the Antichrist is going to do, he wants everybody to worship him. But there was a twofold purpose. Not only does he want people to worship him, and it's an act of rebelling against God, but it's political as well, not just religious. It's religious in the sense that they're worshiping this statue of himself. But politically, it's used, it's intended to symbolize the unity of the various provinces under Nebuchadnezzar's authority. So he's using this dedication ceremony to not only get people to worship him, but also to unite the kingdom. Because he knows the power of religion and the state together. And this, this is what we have. He's trying to get a one world government. He's, this is what he's doing. He's conquered all the nations. What is he trying to do? He's going right back to the sin of the Tower of Babel. He's trying to get a one world government here. He's trying to, and trying to unite it. He's trying to unite these peoples with this dedication, which is the sin of the Tower of Babel, which is what the United Nations does today. It's a, lot, it's a modern day Tower of Babel. That's what they're trying to do today in this country and around the world. They want to have a one world government. And that's why you see the United States acting as a police officer, the military, uh, which is, we're, we've, that's why we've been in several undeclared wars, people. Korea, Vietnam, none of them were agreed by, the, none of them were a declared act of a war. None of these wa uh, wars since World War II were declared act of war. World War I, World War II were declared act of war. They went to the Congress and went to the procedure. These Vietnam, Korea, and the wars, the Gulf Wars, they were not. They did not go through that. And so one of the things that's going on with these wars and us being all around the world is a part of, the, of being a police state for the United Nations because they can't put together a military unit that's powerful enough to gain the respect to stop these uh, conflicts around the world. So what, what, what they're doing is they're using our military to put people in line in different parts of the world. And so I don't, I, 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 for myself, I want our country to just uh, protect our interests. I don't care about any other nation's interests because what's going on is it's all internationalism. See, what they want to do, and you, you probably haven't, uh, I don't know if people know this, it's pretty uh, clear, that they want to basically hand the sovereignty of the nations over to the United Nations and one individual. This is not something, a fantasy. This is what they want to do. So they, basically, who has come up with sovereignty of nations? God. Well, what do, you think, what do you think the Tower of Babel was all about? What do you think the you know, one world government of Antichrist was all, is going to be all about? It's all about Satan having a worldwide rulership through his man and controlling the world and getting the world to worship him rather than God and rather than Jesus Christ. So what Nebuchadnezzar is doing, he's, re, he's reenacting, he's, he's, re, uh, he's uh, redoing the, the sin of the Tower of Babel. He's trying to get a one world government oh, united with his ceremony. This ceremony is designed to unite all these peoples under him. Look at Genesis. Look at Genesis chapter 10, I think it is. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 10. See, God is against internationalism. He's for nationalism. I repeat, he's for nationalism. 
not internationalism. Look at Genesis chapter 11. What did I say, 10? Look at Genesis chapter 11. Please. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. What do they do with the United Nations? Trans, you have, they have headphones on, you notice? What are they, or the ear things? Because they, they get in the translation from like China. If you're English speaking, you can hear what the Chinese ambassador is saying. So they can hear each other. So they can understand each other. It's a dangerous thing. Because look, look what they did years ago, centuries ago. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. You know what that is? Anybody know? Anybody remember? See if you're awake. Shinar. Anybody give it a shot? Tyler? No? It's, it's in the Shinar is where, remember down in Babylon, Iraq? It's Iraq. That's where Shinar is. It's modern day Iraq. Now where, where was Nebuchadnezzar from? Nebuchadnezzar was from Babylon. Where's, where's, where was Babylon? In today's Iraq. And the Medes and the Persians came from the northern part of Iraq and, and, and Iran, as I pointed out to you. So these guys are going in the land. Of, that's why they call the Mesopotamian basin, you might hear me say that, that's what Iraq is. And that's the, they call it the cradle of civilization. Many people believe that's where the, the, it all started. That was, many people think the Garden of Eden is down, was down somewhere in that location. We don't know because of the flood wiped all any remembrances of it. But look at verse 3. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise we'll be scattered ab abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Notice they never consulted God on this. They're doing it themselves. This is another form of idolatry here. They're leaving God out of the whole thing. Verse, look at verse six. Then the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. This happened. This is how we have multiple languages, a multiplicity of languages in the world because of God. And now some people say, I don't see how that's possible. <laughs> yeah, uh, a thousand, two thousand years ago, they didn't think it was possible to go to the moon. They didn't, think, they didn't think it was possible to have lights or cell phones or internet. They would be on television. Don't tell me this because you can't wrap your mind around it that this couldn't happen. There's a lot of things we don't understand that happens. God created the earth with just the word, right? The heavens and the earth. We weren't there for that. So we're going to say that didn't happen? I mean, we, we don't believe that God could do this. Then how can we believe that he's treated, created the heavens and earth with just the word? So if, you disagree, if you don't believe in this, then you certainly don't believe in the rest of the scripture. Because that's a, this, is, this is small potatoes for God to do. Confuse the language, isn't it? If he could create the heavens and the earth with just the word, boom, bring it all into existence, which didn't exist, he could do this. So, Verse 8, the Lord scattered them abroad from over there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, where Babylon started. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, what I brought you there because what Nebuchadnezzar is doing in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel is reach, he's doing over, doing the same thing that the Tower of Babel was doing. One world government under him using the, dead, the statue as, a, as a, something to galvanize or bring the people together. He's got the music playing. We are the world. We are the children. Holding hands with Michael Jackson and all that stuff and Bruce Springsteen and lighting candles and we're all together. We're all gonna, what do you think the Olympic Games is all about today, people? You know what they do there? It's the same idea. Trying to join the world together. Join hands. All the nations together. And we're all going to, and no one mentions Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible. He's cut out of the picture. It's all a manifestation of the Tower of Babel. Now, I'm not just saying, I'm not saying that athletics is sin. What I'm saying is their, their attitude 
of independence from God, these people who put these things together, that's what's evil. Not because a guy throws a discus. I mean, I love watching athletics just like anybody. What's the problem is, is the people who put these things together who are trying to unite the world's nations and different peoples and languages. Didn't Nebuchadnezzar say in Daniel chapter 3? Look at Daniel chapter 3. Look at verse 4 again. What did he say? What did he have the herald say? Look at Daniel 3, 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, everybody's there from all the provinces in Babylon, all around the world. O peoples, nations, and men of every language. And then he tells them, when the music plays, the orchestra plays, hit the deck, worship the gold statue, otherwise you're dead if you don't. So he's getting the whole, he's doing the whole Tower of Babel thing over again. He's committing that sin again of independence from God. Now, who do you think is behind it? Satan. He, Satan's behind it. Now, what we see here is he's having a one world government, and this is what Antichrist is going to do in the future. He's got a one world government, and you know what? The last nation to have a, a government that was worldwide? The Romans, the Roman Empire. And what do we see? There's going to be a revived form of the Roman Empire under Antichrist during Daniel's 70th week. That is, what are they going to do? They're going to unite the world. And that's what they're trying to do, people. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Yes. Yes. Why is it wrong? It seems innocuous. I mean, they're just getting together, you know? The problem is the attitude. Independence from God. Who's the author of that? Satan. Remember he said in Isaiah, I will, I will, I will, I will. The five I wills. I will be independent from God. He seeks the worship of men and angels to himself. And he wants to divert mankind's attention from worshiping Jesus Christ, the creator and redeemer of not only men, but creation and divert it to himself. And he does that by getting you and I, believers and unbelievers, to instead of being worshiping Jesus and having our priorities to please him, he's got his, our attention diverted away from the things of the world. He distracts us to worshiping athletes, to musicians, to our wives, our husbands, our kids, our homes, our money, our wealth. He, we, he, anything. You can worship anything. Worship a cow, but don't worship Jesus. That's what he's trying to do. So the problem with the one world government is they're trying to do it independently of Jesus Christ. Don't say that they are. They're not. Because if they were, they'd be worshiping the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ. They'd be listening to his word. And they wouldn't be doing the things that they're doing. They wouldn't be trying to join the nations up and unite. They would be doing what God said to do, break up, split up nationality, na nations, sovereignty of nations. And Satan's trying to destroy that sovereignty of nations that God has established because he wants the people to worship him and thus worship Satan. See, just like Jesus Christ tries to get the world to worship his father, so we're going to see Antichrist is going to get everybody trying to worship Satan. Now, stop for a second. Now, people's perception of Satan, people say, somebody who doesn't know their Bible will say, boy, I can't see anybody want to worship Satan. Why would they want to worship Satan? I mean, he's, he's evil. Yeah, but you know, he, he, what, you're, what you think, you think that uh, he's in a pitchfork, or some people think he's in a pitchfork. He has a pitchfork and a little, you know, red suit, and he spits out all kinds of blood and everything, and he's really, he's the most beautiful creature ever come to the hand of God. He comes as an angel of light, Paul says. You know what that means? It means he comes as non-threatening, as a beneficiary, a benefactor of men when in reality is not. He shows himself, let's say in religion today, with the ecumenical movement. All roads, everybody, we all worship the same God. You know, I mean, we, you know, we worship the, you know, the Dalai Lama, the Muslim, uh, you know, Khomeini, he, uh, uh, the, the Christian, they all, they all worship the same God, you know? And see how smart, I mean, it's very subtle, but it's totally against God's word. It contradicts God's word. That's the minute you know Satan's behind it, because it contradicts God's word. So he can come off 
as that's what he tries to do. That's what he's trying to do, clean up the world. You, you, he, the world's an embarrassment to him. So he wants to clean up the world the way he wants to do it, not the way God would do it. And God says, you can't clean it up. It needs to be discrucified at the cross, and it was. So we see here in Daniel chapter 3 that this ceremony, this dedication of the statue is political and it's also religious. Now, therefore, we see that, uh, that this, it's going to be, what he's doing here is going to be uh, recreated by Antichrist during the tribulation period. Now, Daniel 3.3 tells us, the reader, that once they all arrived on the plain of Dura, they stood directly in front of this 90-foot tall gold statue, awaiting the call to worship this statue. Now, this is indicated by verses 3 through 7. Now, the scripture teaches that Satan and the king... Now, what, are they, what is he telling them to do? Commit idolatry. Worship a gold image of me. He's committing it himself. What is idolatry? Who's behind it? Satan. It's all around us. I committed it when I was younger. We can commit it today as believers. It's very subtle, but it's disgusting to God. It's disgusting to Jesus Christ. He hates it. We saw this in Exodus chapter 20. You shall have no gods before me. Yet the, 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 we even have Christians today who their wives or their husband or their house, their, their business, their, their job, their money, their bank account is their God. Sports, pro football, baseball, basketball, music, the Beatles, Elvis. Elvis, there's a great thing for them of idolatry. They worship him like he was a God. And the Beatles were the same way. And who do you think promotes these people? Satan. He loves it. So idolatry, Satan is the author of it. Because he's always trying to divert attention, away, worship away from Jesus Christ, and divert it to, the, to himself. Deuteronomy chapter three, 32, verse 17, and 1 Corinthians 10, 20, teach that the worship of idols is connected to the worship of demons, people. Because sacrificing to idols is in reality sacrificing to demons who promote the worship of idols. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, please. <clears throat> Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look at verse 16. De Deuteronomy 32, 16. They, speaking of Israel in context, made God jealous with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. Abomination, speaking of idolatry. They, look at it says, they sacrifice to demons. So when they were sacrificing to these idols, in reality, it was sacrificing to demons. Why? Because demons, under Satan's authority, are seeking to get people not to worship Jesus Christ, the God of Israel, but to worship Satan. So they sacrifice they sacrificed the demons who were not God to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately whom your fathers did not know. Dread. Now look at 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 10, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, speaking to Christians in Corinth, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Yes, since there's one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread, Christ. Look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. He's referring to Deuteronomy 32, 17, which we just talked about. 
read. And I don't want you to become sharers in demons. Now listen to me. One of the things Satan's doing right now, and this is why I say he's so subtle, and people think he's like the exorcist, or he's, and he's into Ouija boards exclusively, and he has, you know, into witches and the go- scary mo- movies and everything. And the, uh, he's, it's much more, much deeper than that and much more subtle. He's subtle like the serpent, right? And you know what he does? One of the things he's doing, and it hit me one time, you know the whole thing with sports? Football? You, I was flipping on the stations once at lunch. I was eating lunch, and I flipped on the station, and you know they have the NFL channel? You know what that is? Football, pro football, 24-7, every day of the year, every hour. Now, the football season has been over, but that doesn't stop people. These people worship the God of football. And they, one of the manifestations is the NFL channel. NFL channel is promoting idolatry. It's, 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 that, that's their God. Same thing with baseball, the Red Sox. When I was growing up, sports was my God. Music became my God. The Beatles were my God. Elvis was my God. Uh, 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 Jimi Hendrix. These people were like, beca- why did, how can I say that? Because all my affections, all my attention and my energies was driven to, to follow them. People do that today. They do it with political candidates. They do it with the president today. They did it with Kennedy and, and Martin Luther King. They did it with Roosevelt. They make hero, Douglas, they make hero worship in this country. You know, they were trying to do it with Tim Debo. Tim Tebow is a Christian. You know, they're, they're making a big thing out of Tim Tebow. Forget about Tim Tebow. Let's make a big thing out of Jimmy, Jim, uh, Jesus Christ. But it's sim- it's, it's, it's sim- is there anything wrong with football? No. But when football becomes above worshiping Jesus Christ and coming to Bible class, huh? Hey, I know Christians who could go through a snowstorm, go through bad weather and bad roads to see an Iowa football game, yet they can't get their lazy little bums over into, into Bible class and listen to the word of God for an hour. They can't show up four times a week, but they sure as heck can't miss the football game. They can't miss it. They don't miss the football game, but they have no problem missing Bible class. Idolatry. And that's what, it's so subtle. Our nation is, one, we're the one of the most wicked idolaters in the world. In history. In history. In history. You know, the people on Wall Street, idolatry. The money, the greed. Money, money, money's their God. It's all a big, it's a big turn, it's a big, they get a big thrill out of it. It makes their lives go. They're thrill seekers. The people love to jump out of planes and, you know, uh, do uh, uh, surfing and dangerous things. You know what that, that's idolatry because they live to get that high. Drug addicts, it's idolatry. That's their God. Alcoholics, the bottle is, the alcohol is their God. They do anything for that. Would miss it. Satan's all behind it. He appeals to the sin nature. The sin nature is by, is by nature idolatrous. Doesn't want to have anything to do with God. Hates God. Leaves God out. That's the world we're living in, people. That's what we see Nebuchadnezzar doing. Practice of idolatry. Now, idolatry, listen to me carefully, idolatry is the worship of something created as opposed to the worship of the creator himself. Uh, Look at Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Paul talks about this idolatry. And that's why the wrath of God is on, these, on, on the human race. Upon sinners. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, against unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. So that means the homosexual, the atheist, everybody. Nobody has an excuse and says they don't know anything about God. They know. They're in denial. I ain't going to listen to him. I ain't going to be accountable to him. I'm leaving him out of my thinking. Therefore, I'm going to worship a man, a woman, money, sports, just to leave God out. For since the creation of the world, 
His invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what was, has been made so that they're without excuse. Now listen to that. If there's a pygmy in Africa and he never hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, he still is condemned and has no excuse. You know why? Because if he worships the creation rather than the creator, he is, he's, 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 he basically, that's rejection to Jesus Christ because he is the creator. So he is, he, if he's not even going to listen, he's not even going to acknowledge that God's the creator, the creation says there's a God, yet he's ignoring that. Like the evolutionist. He's not even going to get to the points of the gospel. He's without excuse. He can be condemned just on that alone. Now, if he believed in the creator, and he said, I'm going to worship the God, who I don't know who he is, who made all these things, then he would be saved. And then he probably, and if he was a pygmy in Africa, they'd send a, God would send a, a somebody with the gospel to him so that he'd know who that God was. I mean, Paul talks about that in Acts at the Areopagus when he talked to the Greeks, to the unknown God. Now look what he goes on to say. Verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. See, they know who he is. They don't want to honor him though. But they become futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools. I just hear on television and that's all I hear. Professing to be wise, they're all a bunch of fools. That's all I think. It's the watching the foolish show. And exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible. Look what he says. It's idolatry. They exchange the, the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. Nebuchadnezzar's sin. And of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They did it. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. That's the definition of idolatry. Who is blessed forever. Amen. They worship the creature, the creation, rather than the creator, Jesus Christ. So what do we read in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3? Remember we studied that? You shall have no gods before me. But yet, we have the God of baseball, the God of football, college football, God of college basketball, the God of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, gossip. You know, watch these stupid, you know, the Hollywood wives show. I mean, people live for their TV shows. Idolatry. They live for their movies. Is there anything wrong with that? With movies and TV shows? Nothing wrong with a movie. I mean, if it's godly, okay. But what's the problem? They're making these things to be their, the object of their affections where God should be the object of their affections. Verse, uh, Exodus 20, 23 says, You shall not make other gods beside me, Nebuchadnezzar. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. So everything we read in Romans and what Nebuchadnezzar is doing in chapter 3 of Daniel and what Antichrist is going to do during the tribulation period, what the Tower of Babel people were doing, all idolatry. And idolatry is the worship of something created as opposed to the worship of the creator himself. Idolatry originally meant the worship of idols or the worship of false gods by means of idols, but came to mean among Old Testament Hebrews any worship of false gods with, with, uh, whether by images like with Nebuchadnezzar's case, or otherwise, or the worship of the Lord through visible symbols. When we get to Exodus 32, the golden calf image thing that they did, it wasn't that they, that when we get to it, Aaron says, this is God. And God said not to do that. They wanted to get a visible representation of him. God said, I don't want you to do that stuff. But that's what Aaron did. Aaron wasn't saying, you know, this is the God of, one of the gods of Egypt worshiped the calf. No, they were saying the calf was representing the Lord. That was his sin. Wait till we get to that. I taught, we taught on that in the past in prayer. Idolatry, listen to me. Idolatry is not only the giving to any creature or human creation the honor or devotion which belongs to God alone, but also is putting anything ahead of your relationship with God and which would prevent you from doing his will. Now, Look at Luke. I love this passage. Look at Luke. Look at Luke 9. Hurry. I don't have much time here. I want to wrap this up. 
I could go on for another couple hours, trust me. Look, look at Luke chapter 9 first. One of the things we like to do is we put ourselves ahead of God's will. We do that. We have to learn not to do that. Our interests have to be subjugated to God's interests. That's what prayer is all about. Jesus talked about this. He tried to te- teach his people, teach the disciples, how to avoid idolatry. He teaches us how to do that. Look what he says in Luke 20, nine twenty three. He was saying to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Now, look at Luke, look, jump over to Luke, uh, let's see, I think it's 14. Look at Luke 14. I'll show you something there. Remember that passage. Yes. Luke 14, 25. Look at Luke 14, 25. Now, he, Jesus is going to, Jesus is going to thin out the, disciple, the crowd of people who are following him. He liked to do that because he wanted to get who the real the pretenders out of there. And he liked to get the people who are real, who are going to follow him, who are, who are, good, are going to be disciples, and he would thin, thin out the crowd. Look, read John 6 sometime. They left him. His disciples, they were believers. They left him because his teaching was too difficult. Sound familiar? Look at Luke 14, 25. He thins the crowds out and he does something that speaks of their idolatry. He's trying to confront them about it. And an idolatry which is very subtle. Look at Luke 14, 25. Now large crowds were going along with him and he turned and he said to them. So he's walking. He turns right around with all these people following him. And look what he says. Boy, I'd love to see the replay of this. But there it is. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Does he mean hate literally antagonistic to your father and mother? No. He's saying the word there means that your number one in affections is your God, me. Your father and your mother, your wife and your husband, your kids all go, your affections belong first to me and then they come second. That's what he's saying. The word hate actually means love less. He says you're supposed to love them less than Jesus. Mary told you a story about my mother years ago when I was a little boy waiting for my, you know, my, she tuck us in and she was the one who told me about the Trinity and praying Father in Jesus' name. And I said to her, Ma, I love you more than Jesus. And she said, don't say that. Jesus gave me you. He, he, gave, you, I, he gave me to you, Billy. I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm a little kid. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Well, that always stuck with me. When I read this, you know, you got he's talking about human relationships. Human relationships, people. This is, I'll tell you what. There's one thing I've learned as a pastor, and this is what I've learned with, uh, in, the, in, in, in being a pastor for a while, especially in Iowa, is that, that human relationships are a God to people. People commit the sin of idolatry with their families. They'd rather go and uh, the classic example is when we had the church split. There were a lot of people who would have came with us but didn't because they're concerned about family members and relationships with other people rather than following God. So idolatry can be, even though, is there anything wrong with your mother and father? Husband and wife? Kids? No! But if they're more important to you than Jesus, that's idolatry. Look what he says, verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So discipleship, the test of discipleship is he, is is Jesus Christ first in your affections? Abraham proved God was first in his affections because, remember he sacrificed, here's a classic story, Isaac, God said sacrifice Isaac. You know what he was doing there? Testing his love and obedience to him and his faith. Do you love this child, which I gave you, more than me? Obedience to me? That's what he's doing. That's what he's testing. He does it to all of us. He's done it to me. He does it to all of us. 
you're always going to find crossroads during the course of your life where God is going to test you. And he does it with human relationships and things. But the human relationship thing is the big, big, difficult challenge. Will you choose this girlfriend over me? Will you choose your wife over me? Will you choose your husband over me? Will you choose your brother, your sister? Will you choose human relationships over obedience to me? It's a big test we always have to face. Ultimately, people, as we close, in the New Testament, idolatry came to mean not only the giving to any creature or human creation, the honor or devotion which belonged to God alone, but the giving to any human desire a precedence over God's will. So there we have the sin of Nebuchadnezzar. He has committed a horrible sin, the sin of idolatry. Not only is he doing it himself, because in essence he's worshiping himself, but he's causing other people to commit the same sin. And then Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I like, them, I like their Jewish names better because they honor God. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These boys are going to show everybody what it's all about, what life is all about. Obedience to God is more important than even our own lives. We're willing to die to obey, maintain our obedience to God. And I left off last evening that I've said, I know very few Christians who would be willing to die for Jesus. If, if I remember last night I said, if, if the country became antagonistic to Christians and they decreed tomorrow out of Washington that everybody's got to worship Allah, everybody down praying to Mecca seven times a day tomorrow. And I'll guarantee you that the people, there'll be a lot of Christians doing it. You know why? You know why. Because they... Don't even, if they're going to be under that kind of pressure, their lives are at stake. They can't even handle a little pressure today when there's a decision between do I choose my wife and what she wants over what God wants. Some guys can't even handle that. How are they going to handle it? Their lives are at stake. They can't handle a little bit of a threat. What are they going to do when they threaten their lives? That's why I say most people will bow. Most people compromise. They do it today. How do you know if you're going to compromise if an order like that came out to worship Allah? You know, are, you going to, are you compromising now? If you're not compromising now, you're probably not going to do it then. Because you know what God does? He trains us for tests. So if you're, doing, if you're blowing it now, you certainly aren't going to make it down the road when the big test comes. And if you're passing the test now and not committing idolatry, then you're probably going to pass the test down the road because he's preparing you for that greater test. Well, we'll pick this up tomorrow. We'll finish off the, uh, this week's classes tomorrow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard and help us to be transformed by the message. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.